Today, I'm going to be hardcore nuzlocking Pokemon Scarlet with only Paradox Pokemon. I'm Chaotic Meatball, and here's a few rules for this challenge on top of the normal ones found in the description. Number one, I can only add a new team member once every three badges. Since there's 18 badges and 7 Paradox Pokemon, excluding Coridon, as I'm not allowed to use Legendary Pokemon, we'll have 1 for our starter and 6 to add throughout our journey, with one exception that you will see later. Number 2, no terastalizing, and lastly, number 3, we gotta have some fun. After all, this is my first full playthrough of Scarlet, and I'm ready to tear into it with these really cool takes on regional variants. Make sure to subscribe to the channel as we're on the drive to 200,000 subscribers, like the video since it helps a lot, and comment down below what other challenges you'd like to see in the future. Oh, and one more thing. This is part one of a two-part video where I complete each respective version with their own Paradox Pokemon. Violet and that respective pool is up on Beast Coast Pokemon, the channel that is part of the esports org that I am a part of, and that will be linked in the description for you to watch after this. With all that said, let's get into our first ever Pokemon Scarlet Challenge. So I've never been one for character customization. Never have, never will be. I just want to play the game. We're dropped immediately into the Paldea region, and into our first day at the Naranja Academy as Director Clavel gives us our choice of starter in front of Nimona's house, our rival for this generation. Despite having Yandere-ish tendencies, we won't be too afraid of her. Afterwards, we choose Quaxley for our starter due to him being the most stylish and overall second best starter in the franchise behind Snivy, we're immediately transforming it into our first of seven Paradox encounters. We'll be rolling how we get these with a wheel, and our first encounter is going to be... Sandy Shocks. This is Magneton's Paradox form, an electric round type that focuses in on being a fast special attacker. Having access to moves like Thunderbolt and Earth Power for Stab, as well as coverage moves like Flash Cannon, Power Gem, and Terra Blast, we're starting pretty strong, albeit not broken as we could <laughs> if we were using, say, Fluttermane or Roaring Moon first. We'll of course be EV training it in special attack and speed, and might I just say this walking animation for this thing is horrifying. No wonder it's a paradox. It's a living horror film in Pokemon form and it just feels uncanny. Though I think it's such a cool take on Magneton that I'm unable to decide how I truly feel about it. Since we chose the Quaxley spot though, Nimona in our playthrough will have Fue Coco, in which I'm able to take her down with three Thundershocks as she does minimal damage with only a single attack before going down. Well, hey at least she doesn't have a starter that's weak to us, like she would if we went with the vanilla starter. I could have given her Quaxley and mopped the floor with her even harder than that, but that wouldn't have been as entertaining. With all that said though, we fall off a cliff, give Coridon a sandwich, and this lovable oaf walks us through a cave only to be ambushed by a pack of Houndour and Houndoom before rescuing us and getting us out of dodge. On our way out though, we're given the TM for Swift by Nimona 2, a great early game coverage move that takes advantage of Sandy Shox's special attack, so I'm pretty happy to get this. Man, just playing this game makes me feel like I'm playing a more substantial RPG like Xenoblade, which is really cool for Pokemon. But it also makes me really want to play Xenoblade instead, because I haven't gotten to play 3 yet. Probably unintentional, since of course, open game made partially by Nintendo is going to feel like another partially made by Nintendo franchise, but I'm not here to dig on this. This is the freshest that the Pokemon franchise has felt since Gen 5, so I'm very happy about all of it. There's a bit more preliminary stuff for us to do though, but if we're getting to the meat of everything, we should just skip to the entrance to the main city of Mesagoza, where we have another interaction with Nimona and we're brought into our second rival battle. She's got two Pokemon this time, first being Fuecoco at level 8, while we send in our level 6 Sandy Shocks. Since there's 18 gyms, level caps are only about a level or two apart, sometimes a little bit more, so we've got to stay under those caps in order to not impede on our own progress and make things needlessly harder. Thankfully, this is fine though, as we'll soon see. We're going back and forth here with Thundershock and Round for a few turns, KOing by the time Fuecoco does around a third to us, leading to our second Pokemon in Palmy. Now, one thing I will complain about with this game is your opponent's movesets. See, Palmy will only know one move here, and after terastalizing, we see that it's Thundershock. This, of course, can affect Sandy Shocks due to being part ground type, so we mop the floor with it with Swift to win the fight. Easy peasy, but that's just the beginning of that problem being across this game. 
Upon entering Mesagoza, though, I make sure to visit the Delibert Present store so that I can buy the Power Anklet. This item boosts the amount of speed EVs gained by 8 per battle, making it 9 EVs if I fight a speed-specific Pokémon. Since we need to train Sandy Shocks without gaining too much EXP and risking us going over the first level cap of 15, we'll need this and the Power Lens for Special Attack to max out beforehand. Thankfully, the Fletchling and Palmy around Los Platos and Poco Path are perfect for speed, and the level 5 Psyduck around the same area are our Special Attack EVs of choice. And would you believe it, of course I don't find a shiny Pokemon during the giant franchise Nuzlocke I've been doing for the past few months, but once I take a break from it, we find one during our first grinding session. KOing this blue motherfucker because I don't care about it, I care about those EVs more than I do a different color. This sums up to Sandy Shocks reaching level 11 before finishing our max out. Thankfully, there's very, very little in terms of required trainers through this game, so after being assigned the three main story paths by Nimona for the traditional Pokemon League story, Arvin for the Titan badges, and Cassiopeia over our Rotom Phone for the Team Star badges, we're clear to begin our regional conquest. So, first things first, we need to make sure to get some TMs. Most of Paldea is accessible without any upgrades, especially with a little bit of finessing in terms of movement. See, while riding Coridon, we can do a jump, then hold the control stick backwards in order to do a backwards long jump of sorts. Climbing up surfaces that we couldn't do otherwise in order to reach TMs that we would probably be unable to reach until we got either the higher jump or the flight upgrade. I guess my years of speedrunning Super Mario 64 didn't go to waste after all. With this technique, though, we're able to get the TMs for Thunderbolt as well as Mudshot to give us the best in terms of our special stab moves. Well, aside from Hidden Power, as that's unfortunately locked behind an area that's only accessible via Coridon's Flight. Perfect, and now we're prepared to go get our first three badges. First up, Cortondo and the home of Katie, the Bug-type gym leader. We've got to play some Super Mario Sunshine first to get to her, as we have to knock this olive into the goal, similarly to the watermelon from that game. Huh, I guess make that two 3D Mario games I've had assistance from by proxy today. With that completed though, we're ready to battle Katie. I'm going in at level 14 instead of the cap of 15, since the next two caps literally only increase by one level each to 16 and 17, so I figure a little wiggle room is warranted. She leads off with a Nimble with only two attacks, nothing too crazy though, as I outspeed with Sandy Shocks, one-shotting with Thunderbolt, leading to Tarantula. She once again doesn't outspeed, being one-shot by Thunderbolt as Teddy Ursa enters last, immediately being terastalized into the Bug-type before Thunderbolt hits for a little over half. Finally, an attack! Sadly, it's just the 10 power Fury Cutter and it does pitiful damage without prior hits having been built up, so a second Thunderbolt to Teddy Ursa seals the deal and the win of the Bug Badge. All of these badges, by the way, correspond to one of the 18 types that exists, so that's a pretty cool detail, I will give them that. Our second badge lies within our first Titan, Cloth the Stony Cliff Titan. This is a pretty simple encounter, seeing as Cloth is a rock type, and doesn't have too much to hurt Sandy Shocks, so two Mud Shots takes care of the first phase as he scurries off to eat his Herba Mystica. Arvin arrives just in time for the second round, sending in Shelter as we combo off of each other, doing around half with Mud Shot and Water Gun, but just not enough as to trigger Anger Shell. Instead, I do so on the second Mud Shot, causing the special defense drop necessary for a second Water Gun from Shelter to pick up the KO following a Vice Grip for around a third to Shelter, winning us the Rock Badge and our first maneuvering upgrade for Coridon, Dashing. Traversing the map is going to be a lot smoother because of that, and I'm very, very thankful for that because of how expansive this world can feel. So, despite our cap increasing to level 17, this is for a Grass-type gym with three Pokémon. I cannot complete a Grass-type gym with only Sandy Shocks, as our only out, Terra Blast, is locked behind beating four of the eight Pokémon League gyms, making it much more sensible to go after the level 19 cap of our second Titan. But not before getting stuck on a vending machine. How in the world am I getting this screen to fade to black off of a damn vending machine? Memes aside, we're able to traverse a mountain, getting through some rolling rocks that once again are reminding me of Super Mario 64. At least this time it wasn't unintentional. 
Now for our actual third badge against Bombardier, the Open Sky Titan. Now being flying dark makes this a lot more doable than it would be otherwise, as two Thunderbolts manages to fell this beast on the first phase, KOing despite Pluck taking my health Orinberry. Arvin comes in during stage 2, bringing in Knackley as his rock type to take advantage of the beneficial type, but Standy Shocks does so much damage with Thunderbolt that it's needless. We're able to KO and get the Herba Mystica for ourselves, boosting Coridon so that we can move across water. 3 down, now we can spin for our next encounter. Wheel of Encounters, turn, 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 yield us the bouncer for which we yearn. Hmm, great tusk. Well, that sucks. That's another ground type for Brasius, which is the Artisone gym leader that has the grass types. But thankfully, it's a physical attacker, and it learns the TM for Ice Fang, so it should go at least a little bit better than I was thinking. Also, in case you're curious as to why Great Tusk has Sunny Day, it's because all the Paradox Pokemon have the ability Photosynthesis in Scarlet. They all get boosts to a specific stat based on if it's sunny out. It's pretty neat, though probably niche in the application. Anyway, after gathering up all of Brasius' Sun Flora, we're ready to freeze his team in time as he leads Petalil as I go with Great Tusk. Now, I'm a wee bit worried about Sleep Powder, but I figure if I don't one-shot, he'll probably prioritize the super effective Mega Drain instead. Thankfully, it doesn't matter as I outspeed and KO with Ice Fang, as we do on his second Pokemon in Small Live, leaving just Pseudowoodo. Now that's an inventive third Pokemon. I'm finally getting to see Pseudowoodo become that grass type that it probably should have been since the beginning. But with Ice Fang doing less than half, it's a lot rougher than I thought it was going to be once he gets Trailblaze going. Two Trailblazes from Pseudowoodo manages to bring Great Tusk down to very low yellow HP, but it's not quite enough. Thankfully, Pseudowoodo's base 30 speed is nowhere near enough for a plus 2 boost from Trailblaze to matter, allowing for a third attack in Bulldoze to outspeed and get the KO, winning the match in a close fashion. Now with four badges in hand and with our next one being against a Dark type user, we're going to want to go out of our way to grab the Brick Break TM for our partial fighting type Great Tusk. However, we can't enter this Team Star base without three Pokemon in our party. So instead of waiting until we have six badges, I'm going to be spinning for our third encounter now. However, we'll have to wait until we have nine badges in hand before we can spin for our fourth encounter. Now for our third encounter, this is going to have to be a pretty strong one. And it's Screamtail. All right, well, this isn't powerful, but it is one hell of a tank. Screamtail as Jigglypuff's Paradox form is a fairy psychic type that specializes in HP with a base 115, the defensive stats at a base 99 for physical and 115 for special, while also having a really high base 111 speed. This is perfect as we are able to use that blend to set up dual screens with light clay, and have things like Noble Roar to lower both attacking stats even further so that we can lead into large scale setup sweeps later. Also, I decided to give it Sunny Day to trigger Photosynthesis a little bit more as being able to be a defensive Mon and then swap out and boost our power of the other Pokemon seems pretty powerful. A pretty balanced addition if I do say so myself, though I'm surprised we still haven't rolled into one of the two broken Pokemon. Now it's a 50% chance though, so this run could either turn into a steamroll following the ninth gym, or we can have Destiny evade us again. Anyway, after clearing out the guards, we're good to enter, throwing out our Pokemon in an auto battle scenario of sorts, clearing out 30 of theirs in a little over two minutes before facing off against Giacomo. He's a dark user, like I said before, but I'm leaning with Sandy Shocks, leading with Mudshot here on his Leap Pawniard as it's super effective against Steel, leading to his Revivroom. This is a dark type one. Apparently it actually changes type. I don't even really know the gimmick of Revivroom yet because I haven't used one myself. I'll probably look into it more once I get to Scarlet and Violet in the franchise Nuzlocke, but for now, its attack Wicked Torque is probably the most frustrating thing we're dealing with, as it's able to put a Pokemon to sleep by chance upon connecting. It's pretty neat that there's finally a move that does this, but it's quite the disaster as it puts Sandy Shocks to sleep, pulling it down into crit range before I wake up. I'm forced to swap into Screamtail upon seeing this, and sure enough the first contact Revivroom makes with Screamtail, it gets put to sleep. I have to gut it out here though, because I need to get both screens up before throwing out Great Tusks. We'll need to at least have enough HP to go ahead and use two Brick Breaks. 
Talk about close though with Screamtail, we have to stay in until it goes down to just 4 HP. Thankfully, we do get up both screens, and this is enough, as we can swap in a Great Tusk, take a few Swifts instead of Wicked Torques, thank the lord, but ultimately come out on top with two Brick Breaks to KO and win the fight. Phew, oh, that almost went disastrously. That sleep luck was abysmal, but at least we made it out with no deaths in the end. Five badges down, 13 to go, as we're headed into Lavincia for our third gym battle against Iono. It's the seriously small streamer versus the criminally chaotic Crisper, but not before Nimona cuts us off for our third rival battle. Not a big deal though, she hasn't popped up for a while, so I'll take it. She's expanded her team to three Pokemon this time, starting with Rockruff as I go with Screamtail to set up dual screens, but with her setting up two Howls, I gotta come back with Noble Roar to lower that attack stat again. Fortunately, despite her trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in terms of just trading Noble Roar and Howl at the beginning, she eventually gives up and starts going for Rock Throw, letting me get her into the negatives. I'm able to set up both screens again afterwards so that Sandy Shocks can come in, KOing with a Mud Shot as Palmy enters second, going down to the same. All that's left is her newly evolved starter, Crocolore, taking well over half from Mudshot as she goes for Yawn, but that sleep is never coming as Thunderbolt is our 100% accurate ticket to a KO, wiping the floor with her and finishing the battle. Alright, now hand me this streamer on a silver platter. She's got a whopping four Pokemon. I see we're hitting emerald levels of base when it comes to team size, starting out with Wattrell against my Screamtail. Despite having a cool typing and electric flying, Screamtail still walls up nicely as Reflect and Light Screen are set up, as well as Sunny Day for that photosynthesis boost as I bring in Great Tusk, taking Pluck for minimal damage despite being super effective as Ice Fang gets the KO. Second out is Belly Bolt, a near one-shot with Bulldoze, but thanks to Water Gun barely doing anything, I can just KO with a second one safely, leaning to Luxio as the sun runs out and Intimidate triggers to lower my attack. I decide to just set up Sunny Day once more as Luxio has no good attacks to use here. Either it goes for Spark and we're immune to it, or it goes for Bite and we resist it. So I'm able to set that up and KO with a single Bulldoze as Miss Magius is all that's left. Well then, Levitate with an Electric Terrastalization. Not a bad one whatsoever. And in fact, it's quite frustrating to get around thanks to its high special attack and access to Confuse Ray. Because of this, I gotta play a little bit of Pokemon Ping Pong with Great Tusk and Sandy Shocks, hitting Ice Fang before being confused, then swapping into Sandy Shocks to take Hex for about a third. Here we can then deliver a Swift to bring her down to half HP, leading to another Confuse Ray, getting that frustrating status onto my active Pokemon once again before swapping back into Great Tusk, taking a Hex for about half damage, but shaking off that attack loss from Luxio's Intimidate, enough to where we KO with Ice Fang to win the battle. Sweet! Six badges down, but we've already rolled our encounter for this point, so let's just keep going with the nose to the grindstone. Seventh badge entails our raid on the Team Star base dedicated to fire types, taking out their guard and 30 Pokemon before battling Mela. She leads with Torkoal and, hilariously, has Drought so that Photosynthesis activates automatically. So I lead with Sandy Shocks rather than Screamtail so that Mudshot can immediately get the one-shot KO after outspeeding, leading into her Rev of Room. This time it's a fire type with Speed Boost and Blazing Torque doing some good damage with two of them as Mudshot gets two hits in. That much is keeping speed boost at bay, but I'm not risking that 95% chance to hit and then seeing Sandy Shocks go down, so instead I swap over to Great Tusk to take that Blazing Torque for minimal damage, since Great Tusk's defense is quite solid. But you know what isn't? His special defense, as Overheat does massive damage in the sun to the point where a critical would have been a surefire KO. But we survive and blast out a stomping tantrum to KO and win the fight. Whew, well that one also could have ended poorly, even with our type advantage, but I guess that's what happens when you're attacked by a literal giant car for a Pokemon. We're nearly reaching the halfway point as our next target is the third of five Titans, However, before we get to the Titan, I found myself trapped in an unescapable corner, forced to a screen fade to black to get me out of there. Boy howdy, I sure do love me some collision detection and environmental functionality. Those are certainly things I enjoy in a good video game. 
<laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, Orthworm, the lurking steel kaiju, is our battle here. Did I just say kaiju? I'm thinking Yu-Gi-Oh again. Orthworm, the lurking steel titan, is our battle here. And despite putting the soft sand on Great Tusk before this battle, I have my brain synapses fire enough to realize that, oh right, Earth Eater is an ability that I have to play around, as it's just water absorbed but for ground types. Thankfully, Brick Break is still a two-shot during the first stage without the Black Belt as the held item, KOing and leading to him retreating to get the Herba Mystica. Despite the power-up though, upon changing my held item before getting to stage two, Brick Break is still a two-shot, winning me the eighth of 18 badges as the ability for Coridon to jump higher is now obtained. Ah, so I see we've gone from Mario to Luigi. At least we're keeping it in line with the other Mario references. With one more gym badge to go before the halfway point, we're finally able to hit the cap of level 30 as our fourth gym battle against Kofu is over in Kaskarafa. He's a bit of an oaf though, rushing off to bid on some other stuff in the town across from Kaskarafa through the desert that's right in the smack dab middle of it, which is kind of funny, but I'm able to bring him his wallet, then we head back and I, uh... I'm not sure what you were expecting, but Sandy Shocks one-shots everything he has. His Vizula, Wug Trio, and Water-type Terastalize Crabominable are all mere... mere insects to the magnet-boosted Thunderbolt winning me the fight. Half down, half in the league to go, I guess. So with our third set of three badges, it's time to add our fourth member to the team. We're spinning, we're wheeling, we're gonna land on something that's not terrible, and it's Brute Bonnet. That's not too bad, actually. Grass and Dark is a nice type combo that we don't have any of on our list so far, and it has the ability to set up using growth while hitting some great stab physical attacks like Trailblaze, basically a grass type flame charge, and Crunch as your basic dark type physical move. For our 10th badge though, we're going in for another Team Star base, this time the Poison type specialist Atticus. At least this Atticus isn't voiced by Jason Griffith and hitting on his younger sister. We're faced with a Skun Tank at first, which we Stomping Tantrum with Great Tusk out of existence, as we do to Rev of Room number 1 and Muck before the final Pokemon and the big old stupid truck Navi Starmobile, Rev of Room number 2, Hullabaloo, whatever the heck it is, comes out last. Since it's a boss Pokemon, I get that it takes more than one Stomping Tantrum, but it can't put up much of a fight against Crate Tusk, so we can just sit here and wail on it for three turns in order to win. And to think we didn't even need a single setup move for that one. Sorry about that one there, bud. I just had the perfect matchup. It's cool afterwards, though, that we get to see Atticus with his mask down as opposed to being completely in the ninja getup. Though is it just me, or does this look similar to the ninjetti outfits from Season 3 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? 10 down, and our next target is the Medali Gym. They want a specific order at this here restaurant, so after hunting down the clues, we're able to order the right thing and walk into the fight with the exceptional everyman, the bodacious businessman, the man I would become if I wasn't a content creator, Larry! He's a normal type user. He leads with Kamala as I go with Screamtail. Since this Pokemon has Yawn, I'm basically using Screamtail to set up Reflect, then immediately swap into Brute Bonnet in order to set up Growth over and over again, despite getting put to sleep with Yawn since I can withstand just about every one of his attacks. It's also because of leftovers that I'm able to continue just sitting here and getting wailed on, eventually getting to set up all of those growths that I need, and KO with a Trailblaze so that I can get some more speed, and then do the same to Dadun Sparse. By the way, amazing evolution. Just add one little piece of a name and another piece of body to this lovable loser, and that's all you need to, you know, power creep Dunsparce. Last out is Staraptor, and that somehow draws a crowd despite being a Route 1 bird in the Sinnoh region. It's cool though, uh, it's just, you know, I've seen it so many times. Anyway, Brute Bonnet is going to need to be swapped out here to avoid being KO'd by this extremely fast bird. I'm swapping into Sandy Shocks to take any flying moves, despite the fact that it terastalizes into the normal type, so I'm not going to get hit for super effective damage. I'm able to Thunder Wave to Paralyze, then zap this thing to smithereens with Thunderbolt. 
Sure enough, despite that terrestrialization replacing that flying type weakness, Thunderbolt is still enough to KO after two shots to win the fight. Perfect. And man, wow, does he just look as depressed as he does normally after he loses than before he loses. He just looks like he's... He looks like he's just expecting a chewing out from his boss who's inconsiderate of his feelings. Speaking of which, there's the boss now! Gito wants to observe our battle against Nomoda, and sadly, she is going to just sit here and wonder, why the hell did I decide to watch the most overexcited girl I've ever seen when it comes to battling stand across from the field with a guy who loves setting up his stupid 25-step combo so that he can prevent his opponent from playing the game? Well, since that's basically what happens with Screamtail. I'm using screens, I'm using Noble Roar to lower attack stats, I'm swapping into Brute Bonnet for growth, and I'm alternating with Protect on certain turns in order to maximize my HP recovery, and we're doing this for a good 20-ish turns before anything fun happens. The worst part about this whole endeavor is that I can't go beyond the game's normal speed. If I could put this on 2 times speed like I could any other game between Gens 1 through 7, this would be much more palatable, but I digress. I'm able to hit Lycanroc with Trailblaze at the end of this long combo fest, KOing in one shot and increasing my speed as Gumi comes in second, falling to Crunch. Third out is Palmo, and... Whoops, should have used the not very effective Trailblaze against Gumi since I'm not fast enough to get past this Thunder Wave before taking Palmo down with a huge Crunch, leaving just her starter's final evolution, Skeledurge. She terastalizes into the fire type, goes for Torch Song, but I'm able to survive and nail a Crunch for the KO and the win. Probably a bit risky to have gone for the Crunch there, but I really thought plus one speed would be enough of a boost to do it, but there's no use looking back on the past when we can't change it, just gotta make sure we are playing to win later instead of, you know, playing to throw for large family guy funny moments. Now on my way to the next gym, which of course I abused the heck out of our backwards long jumping abilities to get to, I ran into a very, very nice TM that I had not initially had on my radar, and that was Baton Pass. You see, Screamtail can learn Calm Mind, a move that would be fantastic to swap into the likes of Sandy Shocks, with the Calm Mind being able to boost up the power of our special moves, or in the future, Fluttermain. But we'll have to see if we spin Fluttermain next after taking out the Montanerva gym. Rhyme is the leader of the gym, but she's got Moist Critical Sledge up here to help warm up the crowd. Really nice to be here on the Chaotic Meatball channel. I'm super pumped that I got to be in the new generation of Pokemon, but man, they really shot a load all over my face. I mean, no white shirt? How could it be without the white shirt? I don't even remember the last time I wore a red tank top. It's like that episode of The Simpsons, where it's a parody of Death Note. Like, it's cool, but what the fuck? Anyway, that's it. See ya. Thanks, AI Moist. Surely you will be the only AI that appears in this video, right? Haha. <laughs> Funnies aside, holy moly, is this double battle against Rhyme incredibly painful? I do not have a clean out to ghost types outside of exactly Brute Bonnet, and I can't afford to bring him out straight away. I'm starting Screamtail and Sandy Shocks as a way to both set up screens and inflict status so that when I can get to Brute Bonnet, I can set up with growth effectively. Thankfully, this works as we paralyze Bayonet with Thunder Wave, knock out Mimikyu's disguise and paralyze it all while getting off a few noble roars on top of the screens that we set up, as Bayonet also has Icy Wind, which is super effective on Brute Bonnet. By the end, I'm able to bring in Great Tusk to set up Sunny Day so we can activate Photosynthesis, bringing in Brute Bonnet last, then getting Screamtail out right at the end as it's at low yellow HP, bringing back in Great Tusk to start dishing out the damage. Ice Fang to Bayonet for half is good, but Icy Wind getting a critical and bringing him down to 17 HP is very dangerous, especially when Sandy Shocks is already at lower than half HP, and Screamtail is almost at threat HP. It's actually pretty terrifying. Thankfully, Sandy Shocks is able to come in and start cleaning house with those stat boosts from the crowd, as Trailblaze from Brute Bonnet KOs Bayonet, then Houndstone comes in third. From here, it's a double KO as Thunderbolt gets a Mimikyu down, as does Crunch on Houndstone, leaving just Toxtricity to Terrestrialize, making it so that Sandy Shocks can land Thunderbolt for neutral damage, KOing and winning me the battle. 
Phew, well, that would have been nice if I had Roaring Moon on my team for the additional Dark type, but alas, that wasn't the case. But with our 12th badge in hand, and maybe it will be the case in just a moment. Alright, three Pokemon to go on this wheel, and I'm very curious as to what we'll be getting. All three Pokemon are actually pretty great. Slitherwing is probably the least of them, but I'm happy with any of these. And... Oh, sweet! We managed to roll Roaring Moon. This Dragon Dark type is a very powerful physical attacker, especially when paired with the TM4 Dragon Dance, plus with physical stab attacks like Dragon Claw and Jaw Lock, as well as Protect to get additional recovery turns from leftovers, you really can't go wrong with that. So our 13th badge happens to lie in the Asado Desert, immediately seeing a Titan Great Tusk running around like it belongs here. Sadly, it does not, despite being the superior design of Dawn Fan, uh, and must be dealt with. Brew Bonnet, send your brethren back to which it came. Trailblaze! Now that was almost a KO, but you know what would be more fitting? If we swapped our own Great Tusk and grabbed the KO that way, using Ice Fang and managing to freeze it, not that the status remains on Great Tusk as we go into Phase 2 alongside Arvin. Here we can just lead our own Great Tusk again, going for Ice Fang for the chance to flinch as Arvin starts wailing on him with Scovillain, though it does go down rather quickly due to the partial fire typing making it weak to Stomping Tantrum. From here it's a rather easy time for me though, as the 2 on 1 scenario bought me just enough time for Ice Fang to outpace him in terms of damage, KOing and leading us to the next piece of the Herba Mystica. This one unlocks the ability for Coridon to glide, and while I thought this would be exactly what I needed to get the TM for Earth Power and finally finish off Sandy Shox's moveset, sadly I can't get up there without the climbing ability. Ooh, unlocked by the literal 18th and final badge in Titan. All good, at least we're still rocking Mudshot for the time being. Now for our 14th badge, we're headed all the way to the southwestern part of the region and the city of Alfernada, the home of the Psychic Type Gym. Now I got a little too fancy for myself, having gone to get bottle caps to max out all of my Pokemon's IVs by this point, but I did not only realize they were not usable items I have to go to a specific NPC, I also have to hit level 50 with my Pokemon. Thankfully, we're at 45, so we're closing in on that, but I figured I'd highlight me having enough cash to go and grab all that's needed for the current party, but be too stupid to be able to use them yet. With that done, we've got yet another fight against Nimona before we go into that gym here, and G wants to test us before we're able to get that badge, or because she just likes battling that much. She leads off with her trusty Lycanroc as I go with Scream Tail, and stop me if you've seen this combo before. We're going for Screens, we're going for Noble Roar, and we're seeing Sand Attack, so that's actually gonna screw us up quite a bit, and ugh, no thank you. I really hate accuracy deprivation so, so much. You know what, I'm just gonna swap into Brute Bonnet and go straight for Trailblaze, but even then, uh, the first turn that I'm out here, I'm not faster, and I get hit with a sand attack and get put to minus one as we KO in one shot and get to Sligu. I figure Brute Bonnet's attack is high enough though to where Crunch will KO if it connects, and sure enough, it does despite the minus one accuracy, so that's two down, two to go as Pawmot comes in third. This electric fighting type can't really stand a chance against Sandy Shocks, so I swap it in and use Mudshot once to KO after being immune from Thunder Wave, leaving just Skeledurge. Now while Terrastalizing and using Torch Song might still seem like a good strategy against me, I'm able to swap into Roaring Moon to resist, alternating Dragon Claw and Protect so that I can outlast his boosts and special attack, but only by just a bit as those boosts are doing enough on top of the additional same type attack bonus that Terrastalization is applying here, but only by just a bit as I'm surviving on low yellow HP after delivering three Dragon Claws to win the fight. You know, for using these post Elite Four Pokemon, I'm surprised how balanced they feel for the rest of the game. Seems like we could have had interactions with the seven non-legendary ones as events on the map, rather than just isolated to Area Zero, but I digress. After clearing this really, really strange gym test as I have no idea what I'm supposed to press or how frequently, I'm able to pull through but with Great Tusk in the box due to going over the level cap by accident. That's fine, not like I'm gonna need a fighting type against a psychic type gym anyway. 
The gym leader Tulip starts off with a Farrah Giraffe, the new giraffe rig evolution, as we, uh, yeah, lead Screamtail. Well, at least here I'm gonna instead set up screens and swap to Roaring Moon instead of Brute Bonnet. Since we have that dark typing, plus a resistance to Farrah Giraffe's coverage moves, plus Dragon Dance, plus Leftovers, plus L, plus Ratio, plus your white, we're able to get to plus six attack and speed, then sweep through the entire team with Jaw Lock, KOing Farrah Giraffe, Gardevoir, Espathra, and the Terastalized Florgez to win the fight. So much for your fairy counters. Would have been nice if you had either a Focus Ash or a priority move. After interacting with Poppy and Rika of the Elite Four and realizing that nepotism is a real problem that must be abolished, we're ready to head back into the Frigid North for our 15th badge, and last one before we finally have a full team of six Pokemon. We're able to bring Great Tusk back into the party and just in time as we're going after the Ice-type gym leader. Weird that the Ghost leader is lower level while being in the Frigid North, but I can't complain. I'm still having fun and it's kind of fine. After taking on the snow slope run as my challenge and realizing that, wow, this does not control very well and I'd rather much play 1080 snowboarding on the N64, we're just about ready to fight the leader. However, I'm going to want to grab the TM for Fire Fang so that Great Tusk can be more useful during this fight. Grusha's waiting for us outside and she's no slouch, starting with Frost Moth as I go with Great Tusk. Yeah, I know, your choice since it's weak to ice, but I've got the speed advantage here. I'm able to use Fire Fang to KO immediately thanks to that 4 times weakness, as she brings in her Bear Tick second. But then I'm able to take it out with Fire Fang backed by a Brick Break, since it misses with Icicle Crash and lets me stay at full HP. Third out is Titan, and while Brick Break just barely misses the KO, Ice Spinner doesn't end up doing much because it's... Well, it's a physical move, and despite being super effective, it still only does around a third. From here, we can finish it off with a second Brick Break, leaving just Altaria. She terastalizes as I swap out into Scream Tail, taking a Hurricane, but unfortunately getting confused in the process. I take the time to try to set up Light Screen before swapping out of the confusion, and I do manage to get it off without hitting myself. Very nice. From here, we can swap into Sandy Shocks and start hammering away with Thunderbolt. It takes three of them, not to mention most of Sandy Shocks' HP, but we're able to survive a Hurricane and two Ice Beams to KO and win the fight. Now, I'm pretty sure I thought that I would have survived a critical there based on Ice Beam's damage, but looking back on it post-recording, I totally forgot that I would have been dead thanks to Light Screen being bypassed by a critical. Simple mistake, but we never lose to random criticals as we've proven time and time again only missing ranges for KOs. So with 15 badges in our possession, we're ready for another team member, right? Well, we're going to want to grab some items beforehand, just grabbing some TMs in preparation for future fights, but following this, we can glide straight on down to our next destination, make it flyable, then spin the wheel. So it's either Fluttermane or Slitherwing, and I'm really hoping for Fluttermane since it's absolutely the strongest Pokemon available to us, with both a base 135 speed and special attack. You can't possibly go wrong with that. And sure enough, we do roll Fluttermane, meaning I've finally gotta go and pick up that Calm Mind TM that I've been neglecting for the past few badges. Oh, and I suppose now I can use those bottle caps to max out every stat I need, aside from the opposite attacking stat on all six of these Pokemon, giving them perfect IVs and an even bigger edge in battle. Now that we can approach the next badge area in the second to last team star base, we're ready to take on these fairy types. Flash Cannon on Sandy Shocks and Fluttermane just absolutely pounding things with Stab, Dazzling Gleam, and Shadow Ball. That should be enough to do work here, but we'll see. After taking out the Auto Battle Pokemon, we're going against Ortega and his lead is Azumarill, basically giving me a free KO with Sandy Shocks' Thunderbolt. Thank you. This leads to Wigglytuff, and I'm firing off Flash Cannon immediately for the super effective damage, but that lack of steel typing on this Paradox Magneton is kind of rough when you're looking for that same type attack bonus to carry that little bit of damage that you need. This is fine though, as it only lands a play rough for about a quarter as Thunderbolt finishes him off next turn. Third out is Dash Bund, and we're basically performing the same dance as Wigglytuff. Two Flash Cannons with his reciprocal play rough only doing a quarter. Last out is Rev of Room, and I've got enough HP to get away with staying in for exactly one attack, firing off a Flash Cannon for about a third before being forced to swap into Great Tusk. 
This is a physical move that he's using, so I'm completely fine with sitting in here and surviving it with physical defense, but of course we get confused on contact with this stupid move. Not a problem though, that's probably a blessing in disguise, as now I'm basically forced to swap into Scream Tail, set up some screens, then take a Confuse Ray as I swap back into Brute Bonnet next turn. He's not fast enough to outspeed a confusion hit, but it eventually is enough for me to get off a trailblaze that brings him to a little over half. Hmm, this is getting a little spicy. Well, I suppose we can go back into Scream Tail and set up the screens again, then just start dishing out psychics to do a bit of damage, but ultimately it's not enough. I need to use Flutter Mane and get that monstrous special attack firing off Dazzling Gleam, but it's also not enough because we're confused now. We've also got Leftovers as our held item, not a person berry, but since we're in range of a KO here, I decide to just shoot the shot and see what happens, bypassing the confusion luckily and getting the KO to win the fight. Phew, well Ortega actually put up a hell of a fight at the end there. Maybe the end game battles will provide me with some challenge after all. Two more badges to go and we're going straight after the last Team Star base on the list. This one uses fighting types and frankly, it's a bit of a joke. With the amount of counters I have to fighting types, it at least should be. Aerie is cool with their wrestling inspired getup, but Screamtail is even cooler with the power of hitting Psychic to KO Toxicroak, and Annihilate after two shots after taking Rage Fist for a little over half. Huh, well, that's a very strong move, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Third out is Basimian, and I figured with this much power behind me I should be able to KO, but it's not quite enough again as we're brought to the brink of death thanks to a well placed seed bomb. Well, shoot, Locario's out fourth, and I don't have much of a way of dealing with him. Uh, actually, you know what? I have an idea. I have the second set of leftovers that I gave to Fluttermane. Let's just bring it in and start using Calm Mind and seeing what happens. And sure enough, it starts working. We even get hit with a critical Dark Pulse during this time to show that yes, the Ghost type can survive with more than enough HP for what's needed, alternating between Calm Mind and Protect to finally put this match out of its misery, KOing Lucario with Dazzling Gleam and Revivroom with Dazzling Gleam just as well, winning the fight straight away. Alright then, that's Team Star down, with only two more battles to handle in this storyline, but we'll get to them in a bit. For now, we still have one more badge to track down. So our last badge against the False Dragon Titan is a bit of a fun spin on things when it comes to the whole ordeal, as we're initially fighting a Dondozo who's only water type, but after the second round we're faked out and seeing a third round against a Tatsugiri who's water dragon type. It's fun, but nothing we haven't handled before, so we're able to take out the first phase with Brute Bonnet, the second with the same alongside Greedent and Tail Whip, then the third and final phase is helped by Greedent firing off repeated Tail Whips to increase our damage output, eventually ending with me using Protect and letting the AI KO her since there's no shot, I would put my Pokemon in danger unless absolutely vital. But with that, Coridon can climb, Mabostiff is alive and awake again, and we're ready to add Slitherwing and the TM for Earth Power to my party and head into the endgame. Thankfully, there's no victory road to bog us down. I can just jump into the Elite Four. However, we've got a battle at the same level cap to take care of first. Well, that and getting the Earth Power TM, like I said. Oh, how I've missed you so. Anyway, the penultimate battle of the Team Star storyline has me fighting against the chairman himself, Clavel. At least this time, it's not Chairman Rose and his stupid shenanigans, but he states that he's the real Cassiopeia. Obviously, I don't believe him and therefore must beat him until he's a bloody corpse. And by beat him, I mean do a 30-step combo fuckfest until my opponent gives up. He leads Orangaroo, and we're going with Screamtail. Stop me if you've seen this combo before! Calm Mind, Baton Pass, and just absolute murder of the team! <laughs> we're able to take out his Poltegeist with Shadow Ball, Obama Snow, Snow Warning can't trigger, and I KO with Psychic, Gyarados, do you even want to ask, and finally, Meow Scarada. Well, I finally got a reason to take a look at this thing, and boy howdy, this bipedal cat gives me some unfortunate vibes that the artists have already used and abused this one for all it's worth. Now that Clavel has revealed that he's not actually Cassiopeia, we're going to the League. Uh, we're leaving this one high and dry since the cap for the League is 62 and Cassiopeia and Arvin are both at 63, so we need to be a little weary with how we arrange our EXP. To the point where I think I just want a rare candy to 62 just to not have more EXP than absolutely necessary. One quiz later and let's start plowing in. 
uh, not not in that way. <laughs> so we're starting out against Rika with Screamtail as she goes with Wizcash, and while I can set up, there's a little bit of a struggle here. See, Muddy Water is a move that has the chance to lower my accuracy, and that's no good when I'm trying to set up a Ton Pass over to a Sweeper. I'm basically forced to swap into Slitherwing every time I see a minus one to my accuracy, to the point where I eventually see if I can bulk up instead, but once a future sight lands and brings me to red HP, I'm back on the main game plan of setting up Screamtail and Baton passing out into Flutter Main. Once the third round of setting up ends up getting to around plus four, and I keep seeing Earth Power, I'm kind of hopeful that we're going to be able to make it through with the plan and not have to worry about Muddy Water. Sure enough, once we get to plus six, we can set up our Reflect, finally baton passing as Muddy Water hits Fluttermane, and it doesn't lower my accuracy. Sweet. Now we're able to go for Dazzling Gleam on Whizcash, same to Camerupt, leading to Dawn Fan. Now Dawn Fan has Sturdy, so we've got to work through it, but this is exactly why we set up Reflect. With it, on the last turn of it, we can survive a super effective Iron Head with over half HP, then when it elapses, we're able to hit another Shadow Ball to KO. We're going to make sure to evenly distribute our power points here as well as we hit Shadow Ball on Doug Trio, leaving just Claude Sire to fall to the same fate to win the battle. Sorry, Bucko. Calm Mind plus Baton Pass equals the destruction of all you hold dear. Speaking of which, here's your, uh, I guess, little sister? Who knows? Poppy's up next, and she's a Steel user, so that's a little rough for Screamtail, taking a little under half from Heavy Slam on her lead, Kaparaja, but that's still enough time for me to set up Reflect and a Calm Mind so that I can baton pass over to Sandy Shocks and use our super effective Earth Power with a little bit of a boost. Kaparaja's Heavy Slam does barely anything to Sandy Shocks, so we're able to KO that with Earth Power leading to Bronzong. Earthquake does barely any damage, as two Thunderbolts takes care of that, leading to Magnazone, who's got Sturdy. Earth Power is quite effective, of course, but with that 1 HP, she's able to set up Light Screen. Well, that's a little bit of a bummer for now, but we are plus one, so we do make up a little bit of that difference, especially once she brings in Corviknight, and despite going down to two Thunderbolts, only wastes her turn with an Iron Defense against a Special Attacker. Well, thank you for throwing the game. Last out is Tinkaton, who goes straight for the Terrestrialization, and we start Fire and Earth Power. First one does just slightly over half, as Play Rough only does around a quarter, leaving me to KO with the second to win. Two down, two to go as Larry enters the fold once again, and quite frankly, I love that this is his overtime job, this time using flying types instead of normals. They've all got crazy good subtypings, though, but his lead is the every single death nail in the coffin all at the same time, as Tropius is setting up Sunny Day and Solar Beam. Hmm, I wonder whose ability triggers off of Sunny Day. It might be my entire f***ing team. This is just free calm mind country for Screamtail. No protects necessary as I just click buttons, seeing a second Sunny Day as he continues to go for Solar Beam. With six up, we can set up Reflect, then book it on out of here with Baton Pass for Flutter Main. And would you look at that, Solar Beam only does three damage after leftovers. We're able to just Shadow Ball Tropius, Dazzling Gleam Staraptor and Altaria, Shadow Ball Oricorio, finally landing one last Shadow Ball on his Terrastalized Flamigo to win the battle. By the way, Flamigo, amazing play on words for such a simple Pokemon, can't believe we're still getting away with this shit in Gen 9. All I can say is, <laughs> I guess let the designers cook. Let them cook and eventually they'll burn down the kitchen. All that remains is Hassle, a user of dragon types. Who's going to be the Hassle, though? It's going to be me. Of course, with the help of my fairies, this should be easy enough, especially when I can just lead Fluttermane and just start sweeping immediately. No boosts necessary. Dazzling Gleam for Noivern and Hexorus, learning Psy Shock at level 63 right after for, you guessed it, the poison type Dragalge. And I know that's the wrong pronunciation, I think it just sounds cooler this way. Fourth out is Flapple, and it goes down to Dazzling Gleam, leaving just the Ice Dragon Baxcalibur. This terastalizes into the Dragon type and falls immediately to Dazzling Gleam. Who needs Calm Mind when you have overpowered super effective attacks? Also, is it just me, or is this Elite Four just a family? I mean, how else is the four-year-old supposed to be part of the Pokemon League without nepotism? Rick is the teenage daughter who's rather lax, but also has a serious mode when it comes to getting down to brass tacks. Poppy's the small, adorable child that everyone loves. Larry is the extremely tired father that works two jobs to support his two kids. And Hassel is the grandpa that helps however he can. 
Then with Gita, she's just the boss and breaking Larry's back over and over again. But hey, that's basically the dynamic, right? Speaking of which, Gita's team is all over the place, even for a champion. She starts with Espathra, the perfect Pokemon for me to just start calm minding all over. However, that ability is a wee bit worrisome. Opportunist allows her to copy any of my stat changes while also getting to plus six with my own work, and she's getting to it for free while also using other moves. Not that it matters, since late screen helps keep that damage at bay, and Reflect will be good for later Pokemon that may not go down to one shot, but I doubt they won't. But with that, we can go into Sandy Shocks off a of Baton Pass as she sets up a Reflect of her own, then start going to Pound Town. Thunderbolt does a little over half with our plus six Dichotomy as she uses Lumina Crash, harshly lowering my special defense after landing, but unable to be capitalized on as the second Thunderbolt does her in. Huh. You probably should have led with that move once you realized that I was using Calm Mind! Second out is Avalug as Light Screen fades out, with Flash Cannon doing the job as Veluza enters third. Thunderbolt's super effective here and does the job, leaving Gogo out fourth, which is a little strange. I don't have anything to hit it for anything better than not very effective damage, but Thunderbolt as a stab move still KOs despite being resisted. Fifth out is... Oh man, that's such a cool design for Bisharp's evolution, King Gambit. I hadn't realized the original two were named after chess pieces, since it would have made sense to end the evolution line on the king immediately, but I guess four generations later is better than never. Earth Power squashes the dark skill type, allowing four Glibora to enter last. This is just a rock-type Pokemon that, quite frankly, could have evolved from Minior and I would have believed it, but it doesn't have Levitate, so I don't care. Earth Power, and we're done. Well, that's what I would say if there wasn't exactly four more fights to take care of before we're done here. Of course, that means we need to finish up the three storylines before jumping into the last story. Wait, how did I just now realize that this is just a Sonic Adventure game where I have to go through multiple paths to get to the real ending? I guess we've pulled from all sorts of sources for this one. First up is Arvin, who shares a level cap with Cassiopeia at level 63, and boy howdy does it look like either Sandy Shocks or Fluttermane is going to be unusable after this fight one way or another. I'm swapping the latter of the two out for Great Tusk for the time being, and hopefully that'll be enough gas left in the tank for the other fight. He's leading off with Greedon as I go with Scream Tail, and stop me if you've seen this combo before. We've got Screens, we've got a Calm Mind, we've got Paralysis since Body Slam is a dickhead of a move, but we don't get held down by it all that much as I continue to set up and heal with Leftovers. It's by the time that I want to set up Screens again, that's when it starts holding me down, as I get to around half HP, before finally getting the Baton Pass off and sending in Sandy Shocks. Thunderbolt to Greedon does the trick as Toad Scroll comes in second, and... Huh. Did not expect to like a land tentacruel as much as this, but I'm digging it. It's ground grass, so I go for earth power, and at plus six, she still survives. I see that it has retained a tentacruel's ability to survive special attacks like a freaking champion. And lands a massive power whip that takes Sandy Shocks all the way to 23 HP, but it can't outspeed, so I'm safe for the second earth power. Well then, that brings Sandy Shocks to level 64, so we're over the level cap and must swap out of this Garganacil into Brute Bonnet. We're able to KO here with two Trailblazes against the Rock Salt Pokemon, as Scovillain enters fourth. Hmm, well that fire typing is a bit worrisome, so I bring in Roaring Moon to resist everything and set up Dragon Dance, taking a little bit of stealth rock damage in the process, as that's what Garganasil was able to set up in the one turn that it had available. Eventually, we survive all five Fire Plasts and start seeing Energy Ball, but at this point, I'm more than powerful enough to Dragon Claw Scovillain, Cloyster, and Mabostiff through Intimidate and the Terrastalization to KO and win the fight. One level 63 opponent down, one to go as Cassiopeia, otherwise known as Penny, is an Evolution user. Not something they've actually pulled in any previous Pokemon game, unless you consider the collective five Kimono Girls as the Evolution users, but I will certainly take a boss that uses six of them. She leads Umbreon as a lead Screamtail, and this has to get boring at some point, right? Despite having Dark Pulse, the fairy typing keeps it from being super effective as we resort to setting up Calm Minds, not even needing the screens or Protect in between turns to help heal us with leftovers. And quite frankly, you know what would be even funnier because we don't need those moves? Sweeping with Screamtail because of that fact. It gets Dazzling Gleam, it gets Psychic, and let's get crackin'! 
Dazzling Gleam blasts through Umbreon for super effective damage, as does Psychic for neutral damage to Flareon as Vaporeon enters third. It manages to survive a plus six stab attack, props to it, dishing out Hydro Pump for barely any damage since, you know, special defense, and that didn't go anywhere. Dazzling Gleam picks up the slack as Jolteon enters fourth, missing Thunder as our Psychic KOs, as does Dazzling Gleam to Leafeon, leaving just Sylveon. Now with Urterastalized into the Fairy type, we can't use Dazzling Gleam since it's not going to KO, but Psychic somehow also doesn't KO in one shot either. Not that it matters though, there's no way in hell she can one shot Screamtail with how bulky they are, so the second Psychic does the trick to KO and win the fight. Perfect. Now we can seal the deal on the Victory Road scenario. Nimona, or as Google Docs continues to autocorrect her as, Pneumonia is ready for a cap of level 66, and I'm ready to finally get some use out of Slitherwing. Without the fire typing and the addition of the fighting typing instead, we're able to actually lead it against Lycanroc and it not do much damage because it's neutral rather than quad effective with Stone Edge. In fact, alternating with Protect and the defense increase from Bulk Up means we're overall gaining HP more than we're taking damage, eventually getting back to near full as she's forced to start using Drill Run after running out of the 5 power points from Stone Edge. Excel Rock doesn't do much either, and once we're at plus 6, it's time for the heavy lifting. Brick Break to Lycanroc, Brick Break to Palmet, Brick Break to Dunsparce, Brick Break to Orthworm, Brick Break to Gudra, and Skeledurge is a ghost type. If it wasn't for the AI that is programmed to terrestrialize away the ghost typing. So brick break and boom, we've won without using our full move set on one Pokemon. If that qualifies me as being a rival for life, boy howdy, she's going to need to get a whole lot better to beat me. You know, when you go one on one with another trainer, you usually have to 50-50 chance. But when you go against me, I'm a genetic freak, I'm not normal, so you have a 25% chance, at best, at beat me. But then you add Kurt Angle to the mix, I'm getting ahead of myself. I didn't even have Steiner Math scripted, I just started saying it out of memory. Oh, the internet has cursed me with knowledge that I'm never going to be able to forget until I'm dead. But with all three storylines sealed up, it's time for the Great Crater of Paldea, Area Zero. This is an area with a lot of story, not much in terms of substance and battles for a challenge, but having only experienced this for the first time and not really having much spoilers for the game, this was the moment that cemented this game as better than Generation 5 for me. I know, performance hiccups and whatnot, but playing this on an emulator so that frame drops didn't occur, and so that the game was mostly running at normal speed made this a dream to play. And Area Zero, what a place to look at! I mean, shoot, I really wish Monolith Soft had had their hands on this project, because this would have looked gorgeous. Compare this to Gar Plains from the original Xenoblade Chronicles, and tell me that you don't agree. There's no shot otherwise. But with our complete descent through the four locks and into the caves of the core, we're ready. The ultimate unveiling of the Professor being an AI, and a dangerous security protocol bent on invading the modern world with Pokémon from ancient history. Seems like you've already gotten your wish, seeing as I'm already running about with a full team of Pokemon from olden times, but I suppose I can seal that time machine right up so that my team is more of a bragging right than an invasive species. Sato leads off with Slitherwing as I'm going Screamtail, and sorry bucko, you lost based on that lead alone. Lunge may lower my attack stat, but, you know, reflect, protect, Calm Mind, Baton Pass, Leftovers, all of these things are your undoing, as we're just pushing, and pushing, and pushing. And pushing the Mons back and forth, it just keeps going on forever and this thing is a bore. They just keep pushing along until the AI falls off the ledge of the building and is presumed dead. I mean, I think, we're almost there, but the game forces us to break our rules. As we have to use Coridon, we have to terrestrialize it, it's nothing that I do sacred. Well game, did you have fun? Did you have get off from using me as your sick, twisted puppet, stringing me along until the end where you decided, hey, I'm gonna snap all those self-restrictions you've been doing all this time. Well, f you, at least I now know. Following this, we're all safe and sound, and the AI sends herself back to the past, and we're clear to go. 
though I think Arvin certainly should have had a little bit more of an existential crisis, realizing that his mother is dead and that an AI version of herself sent herself back to the past, likely to get gored to shit by a great tusk, but I guess we're just gonna overlook that. <laughs> Who are we to care, though? We're done here. That was a hell of a challenge, wasn't it? I know it wasn't super difficult, but I wanted an excuse to use these really sick, unique Pokemon. Plus, I haven't seen anybody else try the paradoxes before. But with that all said and done, we've done it, and without deaths as well. If you'd like to see how the pool from Pokemon Violet does, make sure to check out the video in the pinned comment as well as on screen, and I'll catch you in the next video. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.